again for coming. This is our third evening for our poetry series this year, and Melissa Rosada Oliva will be reading for us tonight. She'll be using the projector and the screen, so that'll be a little different. That's why we have a different arrangement tonight with the seats. I will just turn this over immediately to Jason Reber, who will introduce our poet. Melissa Lozada Alina is a writer and performer. She is the author of Paluda, a collection of poems about the intersections of hair removal and Latina identity. She is, M she is an MFA candidate at NYU, where she also teaches creative writing. Her work has been featured or is forthcoming in Muzzle Magazine, The Huffington Post, nice, or The Guardian, the Adroit Journal and Cosmonauts Avenue. She is somewhere in this room right now, feeling very nervous. <laughs> Melissa. Hi, thanks so much. Um, give it up again for Sadie. That was so good. didn't do go into music, so I just wrote sad poems instead. Um, so I always really admire seeing young women sing in front of a bunch of people um, and play guitar. Um, hi, so my name is Melissa, as Paul mentioned. I live in New York City. Um, I came from Boston today. My mom just ran the marathon for the 11th time, <laughs> um, which is a bit insane. Um, after like the fourth time, I'm like, why are you so good at this? <laughs> what are you running from? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I've been, I'm like in a strange emotional space where I'm like around my family and like seeing my mom like run is also, also, always emotional even though it's the 11th time. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm just going to read some poems from you. Um, I wrote this book mostly for my mom. My mom, well, I wrote it with the ideas of my mom in mind. My mom is a beautician um, by trade, uh, so she waxes people for a living, and that is how I ate lunch as a child. That is how I got to do like after-school programs as a kid, um, because my mom was like working off um, you know, tips by waxing people's armpit hairs and other hairs. I'm not sure how explicit I can be in this room. <laughs> 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 Alright. Um, so anyway, growing up with um, the ideas of like hair removal um, that kind of like did something to me as a child and like <laughs> um, definitely affected the way that I understand like my like womanhood and my relationship with uh, Latina identity, um, and I was kind of like obsessed with it, um, and I still am like obsessed with like hair and hair removal and like the ritual of it, um, and like the the crisis of it, I guess. And so I wrote a book about it with button poetry called Peluda, which means hairy girl. Um, in some and like a Celtic culture, it means like monster that runs into the town and eats babies. <laughs> um, not something I can yet relate to, um, but maybe something I saw in Game of Thrones on Sunday. <laughs> um, so here's one called uh, Maybe She's Born With It, Maybe She Got Up Early. I don't know who or what the good immigrant is, but I think my mother could never get away from being the cleaning lady. Maybe she has always been a knot in the neck of a trash bag. So instead of a white lady house, it was a white lady body. Instead of dirt from curtains, it was soil beneath nails. Instead of clean countertops, it was faces with blackheads. The girls in the bathroom say that their mothers never taught them about beauty stuff. And anyway, beauty is ephemeral. I don't know what ephemeral means. 
but I know I bought sandwiches for lunch with my mother's tips. I know that when the economy crashed, beauty was the first thing my mother's clients crossed off their weekly budget, so they let their nails grow jagged, let their bikini lines become bikini borders, and I know that the first time I got my heart broken, mommy took me into the kitchen and waxed my eyebrows, told me that the best revenge was looking your best, reminded me that beauty is a lot of things, but mostly it is pain. So Al will win the pageant. Ay carajo shit has metal around her neck. Como Meduela drives a shiny car with the top down to the prettiest place in the world. <laughs> I've been like compulsively wearing that jacket all weekend because my mom doesn't know about all my tattoos. Oh. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like hot in here. <laughs> Why am I wearing this, like, freaks and geeks jacket? <laughs> um, okay, so, okay, I'm going to read a few more from this. Um, I'll do one from memory. How's that? Haha, <laughs> impressive. Um, okay, this is called My Spanish. And some iterations, it's, <laughs> you know how to say, in this book it's called, you know how to say arroz con pollo, but not what you are. I was like, oh, so deep. And then I, like, never say that in the poem. This one's called My Spanish. Okay. <laughs> if you ask me if I am fluent in Spanish, I'll tell you that my Spanish is an itchy phantom limb. It is reaching for words and only finding air. My Spanish is my third birthday party. Half of it is memory, the other half is that photograph on the fridge. My Spanish is a puzzle left in the rain, too soggy to make its parts fit together to look just like that photograph on the box. My Spanish is proper nouns, dressed in pearls and bracelets. My Spanish is, are you up yet? My Spanish is, there's a lot of work to do today. My Spanish is on a resume as a skill. My Spanish is on a toothbrush and red mouth marks. My Spanish is on a shirt and red mouth marks. My Spanish is so hungry. My Spanish reaches for words the top of a shelf with no stepping stool. It's hit in the head with all of the words that have been hiding up there. My Spanish asks you if it's bad to eat words that are expired. My Spanish asks you if it has an expiration date. My Spanish wants to let you know it is not something to be eaten and then shit out but does not really believe it. My Spanish, my Spanish, if you ask me if I am fluent in Spanish, I'll tell you my Spanish sits in the corner of the classroom chews on its pencil, never raises its hand. My Spanish is my sister's sore smile at her only beauty pageant. My Spanish is a made-up story about a parent who never came home. My Spanish is a made-up story about a parent who never came home but traveled to beautiful countries, sent me postcards from all of them. My Spanish is me, tracing every letter they were able to fit in. My Spanish is true story of my parents' divorce, chaotic, broken, something I have to choose to remember correctly. My Spanish is asking me if my parents are American, are citizens, if I'm white yet. My Spanish, my Spanish, if you want to know if I am fluent in Spanish, I'll tell you a story of how my parents met in an ESL class, how it was when they trained their mouths to say I love you in a different language. I hate you with their mouths shut. I'll tell you how my father's accent makes him sound like Zorro. How my mother tried to tie her tongue to a post with an English language leash. How the tongue always ran stubbornly back to the language it had always been in love with. Even when she tried to tame it, it always turned loose. I'll tell you that my Spanish is understanding that there are stories that will always be out of my reach. There are people who will never fit together the way that I wanted them to. There are letters that will always stay silent. There are words that will always escape me. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, this one is a weird one. Um, I wrote it after Ocean Vong, um, who wrote a beautiful book of poems called um, Night Sky with Exit Wounds. And I basically just copied like a line where he was like, if not, if the house isn't burning down, then eat your clothes or something. Like, I really just love the, um, like the thought process of saying like, if not something, then something else. Like all of these alternate um, solutions. Um, and growing up like in an immigrant household, like all I had were like alternate solutions. Like, okay, like your pencil's broken. Like, let's uh, 
we don't have a pencil sharpener. I don't know, whatever. I, my mom was always doing like weird, like, <laughs> um, like I would have like a sty on my eye and my mom would be like, rub the cat's tail against the eye three times and it will go away. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so this is called, I'm sorry, I thought you were your mother. If you don't understand the joke, then perfecting your American laugh. If not catching the reference, then writing it down to Google it later. If not beautiful, then something they can hear through the walls. If a bad cook, then hungry for something else. If an ugly scar, then a story to tell over and over again. If not pretty, if not hermosa, if not preciosa, if not muñeca, then at least funny. Then just like your father, I guess. Then juggling eggs and balancing your passport on your nose. Then tripping and letting the eggs crash around you. Then not blaming your clumsiness with the world. Sitting down with your smooth ivory leg stuck out waiting for you. If not, ay carajo, then shit. Sorry, so many swears. If not in love, then discounted 24-hour loneliness that comes with an application wand. If not satisfied, then a minute before the alarm. If not happy, then whatever you pin to the fridge. And if their mouths are not open, if their throats are not full of spit, if no one is laughing, then taking yourself home. You, niña, lotioning up stretch marks that don't have memories yet. Patoja with report cards for eyelashes. Hija, afraid of having hijas. Girl rolling her sentences together and gluing them to her face to make them to make the perfect mustache. Girl twirling the mustache and saying, aha, yes, my darling, aha. Girl cleaning up her mess before it spills out of her eyes. Tying wires around her body, attaching tin cans to the end, holding them out to the air, trying to find someone who will listen. Hey, girl of the rebuilt kitchen, of the Windex reflection, girl with the bent glasses, girl looking in a different mirror, girl not letting herself go, girl letting herself stay. Who are you? Fooling. They just have to take one look at you to know where you came from. Called, I shaved my sister's back before prom. <laughs> I can never read it when she's in the room. She's like, I'm oh, so sorry. <laughs> um, I shaved my sister's back before prom. In our family, we believe everything is inherited. If hair is from our father, then fear must be from our mother, who is not hairy, actually, and not that brown either. But still, her accent coats her skin and sticks like wax. Mommy says, keep your legs closed. Puppy says, look people in the eye. Our bodies have always made love to shame. So maybe this has always been about our parents and all the things we never told them and all the ways they made us different. I lather up my sister's back, much more elegant, better posture. She didn't inherit heavy breasts like me. My back bent forward, nipples lined with hair like sneaky little girls who crept out past their bedtime to listen to the adults fight. The razor makes soapy paths across her back. Bubbles burst and laugh together at the forks in the road. Bitch, are you done, she says. I take a towel. I wipe the journeys away. So um, I am in MFA program at NYU, and my uh, currency of life is obsession, paying attention to obsession. And one of the obsessions of my life, which is very, it's like interesting that I'm in a town called Selena, or Selena, um, is the late uh, Selena Quintanilla, who was murdered by her best friend, Yolanda Saldivar. Um, so I've been writing a bunch of poems about her. And today's actually her birthday. Um, so I'm going to read from my manuscript. Um, she would have been 48 today. So thinking of you, Celina Quintanilla. <laughs> um, OK. Let's see. Which one should I start with? How do I win you over? OK. <laughs> Okay, yeah, let's start with this poem. Um, 
So I wrote a poem called Cast of Characters. Um, also, how am I on time? How much time do I have? Am I going over? Plenty. Plenty? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so, yeah, this is called Cast of Characters, in which I outline all of the characters who are going to show up in the manuscript. The manuscript also, the, I was telling Laura about this earlier, is, um, the concept is, I bring Selena back to life through a seance, and there are disastrous consequences. Um, okay, so, Yolanda Saldivar, as BFF for life in possessions of breasts and a vagina, short hair when she's a villain, long hair and a braid when she's little and playing hide and seek, massive manipulator, possible lesbian, behind bars, hand reaching out of the dirt with vengeance, mummy, a smell of gloro on Sunday mornings, heavy feet thumping up the stairs, wet man's jacket hanging up to dry, sound of urine sprinkling because the door was left open, as a discounted bottle of wine, as salty soup on a hot day for no reason, as a hand over the mouth because there's pain in her tooth as bras tangled in one another and left in the dryer, starring Papi as the word of law, which you must learn to say if you're going to start singing in Spanish, as in the future isn't real. The future is just a story we tell. Everything is a sign if you really think about it. One day, you'll be on a stage and you'll hear the applause deep in the center of you. You are the stadium. You are the emergency exit signs. You are the overpriced judos. You're the chariot led by white horses. One day, you'll get the news and you'll be squealing, jumping up and down, wrapping your legs around the first person you can see. You are looking up at yourself. You are about to get there. You are always going to be there. Um, but a big part of that is that she's a virgin. Um, so this poem is called, I'm Not a Virgin, But. I'm not a virgin, but I want to appear to you in sandwiches, water markings on the ceiling, mold above the toilet, patterns in woven baskets, a scattered plot depicting the correlation between people who lick their ice cream and people who bite their ice cream, and whether or not they lie about how many books they've read. I want you to gather strangers around the image of me because you've got to make sure it's me and not a trick your eyes are playing on you. And I want the strangers to confirm your vision. I want them to tell tales about me. I want endless products in the shape of me available in delis and on the side of the road. I want to be the one abuelitas light candles beneath. And I want to be the picture on the candle, stretched out and replicated. I want to be the one who gets daughters into colleges with full rides, brings the GoFundMe page to completion, gets shoved into the backpack during the big flood, gets hanged from doorknobs in new apartments as a sign of protection, as a sign that whoever lives there is loved. And I want everyone to believe in me eventually. But I want it to be you who finds me, plain as day, blooming among the flowers, shining from the hill, taking shape everywhere I shouldn't, obvious and made of light. Uh, a universe in which uh, Selena doesn't die, um, alternate universe in which she doesn't die. Um, yeah, cool. It's for Selena. <laughs> Selena doesn't die. She just makes more hits. Another bop, commercials. She stars in a movie with Johnny Depp. There is a flirtation. There are rumors. She takes a hiatus from music after a throat condition. She buys a farm in San Antonio with white horses and her husband. Johnny Depp calls her at 12.47 a.m. every night. She twists the phone cord around her finger. There is giggling. There is a day that Johnny stops calling. Selena tries to distract herself. Selena looks at her sleeping husband and sees a good man. In the evenings, they look at each other in the eye and one says pizza. The other one says pizza. There are days and days of pizza. Five months go by and still no word from Johnny. Selena cuts her hair on impulse. She doesn't return her agent's calls. She is heartbroken but can't tell anybody about it. She has a crush on the guy at the gas station. One night when her man is out, she invites him over and they make love in the horse stable. She feels very alive. Her husband comes home and she confesses. He hits her. No. Her husband comes home and she confesses. He thinks about hitting her with the white horse to interrupt. They buck and they neigh and they demand to be looked at. No. Her husband comes home and she says nothing at all. And he kisses her goodnight. No. Her husband doesn't come back. He gets into a car and the car evaporates. Poof. Gone. 
Selena's belly grows rounder and rounder, and the days stay the same because she is in a sunny place. Her baby comes. She names her Flor. I want to also, so I'm thinking a lot about Yolanda Saldivar, who was very villainized by the Latina community. She did murder somebody. Um, but I'm, I'm fascinated by the, um, by the villainization of her and how it's the stuff of novelas and how it is the stuff of like deep and green homophobia. Um, so this is an alternate universe where Yolanda Saldivar gets away with it. The maid makes her morning cleaning rounds, and I clamp her mouth shut with my hand. I hold the gun to her head and demand she undress. She nods and begins to unbutton. Her belly fans over her panties the way mine does, and blue veins sprout over her cornflower thighs. Her breasts hang like two arms of a forgotten sweater. She's got dyed black hair that thins at the top in a perfect circle. In another life, we would be cousins. In this life, one of us has to die. I slip into the maid's blue uniform. I two-step over her body in the blood spreading around her head. I hide the gun in my pants. I push the cleaning cart into the lobby. I stop at the water fountain. I sip. I'm feeling cocky. I wipe my mouth. I take my time. I hide my face behind the white folded towels. I push past the pool, the parking lot, a bank of rooms, the restaurant towards the entrance where the staff kneels over you and your expiring body. Remember when you would call me mom? I push into the heat of the parking lot. Blood starts to dry on my face, a small, rusty sun. This uniform is itchy now. I am already tired of this role, but I keep pushing. The wheels keep spinning, but they can't drown out the sirens squawking for you. A bottle of shampoo falls from the car and begins to roll. I leave it. I do not look back. I push, and I push into the glaring daylight. No one will ask me where I'm going. No one will ask me who I'm going to be. Want to know how it ends? Yes. Um, so, everything. There are disastrous consequences. Selena can't, um, you know, every, the world is ending because they brought Selena back to life. And in order to um, kill her again and make everything right, I, I have to go down to the underworld karaoke bar and sing, um, which is an idea I got from The Leftovers, and I will credit it according to my promise you. Um, so this is called Midnight at the Underworld Karaoke Bar. It's midnight at the Underworld Karaoke Bar, but I'm thinking it always is. You are yourself, but you are not yourself. Here, we have to pay with secrets. I've told you everything already, so you put in two for me. I try not to think of the secrets nestled in this fish bowl, overlapping each other with their ribs and folds. We look in every room. Sometimes it's Selena singing in the room, sometimes it's me, sometimes it's the two of us so together and fighting over the microphone, sometimes it's you singing with somebody else. I hate that one. We enter a room together. You are not singing, I must sing for you. There are 50,000 songs to choose from and I type in the one I know the best. You get up and I go to the bathroom in the middle of the song. And you go to the bathroom in the middle of the song. I'm offended, but I keep going. I know I have to keep singing in order to get myself out of here. I know I have to be okay with where you go. I know I have to be okay with who you want to be. I sing, I sing, and I sing. I can't actually hear myself, just the music. I have to trust that I know it, that I can hit all of the notes. There is no applause. There is no one else singing along. The Selenas do not come in, impress with my range. The yous do not watch, follow the yous do not watch falling in love with me. The evil me isn't even ridiculing me. There really is no reason to be here. What does it matter if no one is watching me? If no one is telling me, good job? I close my eyes. I am crying, which is humiliating, but it's not like anybody else is here. There are no windows. There are no mirrors. I have no idea what I look like. I have no idea how I sound. Um, okay, that one is weird. Um, but, 
to this last one. Thanks so much for um, hanging out with me. Um, I'll be, if you want to purchase one of these books, they're $12, and they'll go to this great library, um, and libraries save the world, I believe. Um, applause for all the librarians in the world. Yeah. If anyone wants to talk to me about stuff, or if you made someone uncomfortable, please let me know. Okay. Um, so this is the last, this is the show that Man and Eddie missed. In this situation, I am the adoring singer. Um, actually, no, I won't make you do anything. Okay. I'm the adoring singer, and you're the audience. Who loves me. <laughs> okay, so here we go. This one is for all you lonely hearts. You are perfect, and I love you so. This one is about the person you love. Sounds familiar to me, what is the one? Have you ever been in love, but you were worried? Play the one that we know best, yeah. This one is about pain, but also not. We are so excited to hear it, wow. This one is for anybody who dreams. It's a song that you sing with your mouth whole. A lot of us travel from far away. You've heard it before, and you will hear it. This is us. Goodbye. We wanted the big hits. Okay, so I don't remember the words. Thanks so much. <laughs> The infamous Salinas, Kansas question and answer oh, yeah. session. Um, and, uh, this is Does anybody have any questions? Come on! Yeah. How long it took you to write that? The sonnets? Yeah. Um, a few hours. Because it had to be like, oh man, Eddie. <laughs> What happened? Like, it has a count. <laughs> um, yeah. Someone said it sounded like I was people, people learning English. <laughs> um, but yeah, it took me a while. <laughs> Do you read your poems to your family? Um, my family comes to my shows. Yeah. Um, yeah, my mom. A big fan. <laughs> Do you always have to wear your coat? <laughs> um, no. I just don't. She knows I have tattoos. I just don't want to talk about it, you know? Because <laughs> she's always like, why do you want to be ugly? <laughs> um, and I'm like, Mom. <laughs> Yesterday she was like, people are paying attention to you. Stop dressing like you aren't from the 70s. <laughs> um, anyway, it's just like Latina Mom stuff. But <laughs> yeah. Are you the first poet in your family, or I bet not? Um, no, I mean, yes, I'm, yeah, my grandmother doesn't know how to, like, read or write, um, my mom only has, like, a eighth grade education, there's not a lot of, like, writing, but there's a lot of storytelling, deep storytelling, metaphors, things to make us understand other things, so maybe not the first poet in my family. But the word. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. What would you like to tell us about NYU? Oh, um, <laughs> what would you like to know about NYU? <laughs> What's it like? Um, well, NYU is, is, is interesting. I'm in, so I'm in the MFA program there. It's like two years long. I'm in my second year, going into a third year because I decided to go part-time. Um, yeah, I'm learning a lot. I'm reading a lot. It's taught me how to be a better reader and listener, which I think is important for anybody who writes because um, you have to, you can't just be like listening to yourself. Um, yeah, I'd say I've learned a lot. I'd say also I'm critical of institutions all the time. <laughs> um, and like, you know, giving money to learn. Um, I feel, yes, I'm like, could I have done this on my own? Maybe could I not have? Anyway, it's a constant, I'm contending with it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my podcast is called Say More, <laughs> um, and it's with uh, Olivia Gatwood, who's a poet, um, yeah, amazing writer, um, speaker, 
and we basically just started, we were like, we love hearing ourselves talk, <laughs> let's record it. Um, and also we wanted to honor like knowing, like knowing it very, having like a PhD basically in like really ordinary things. <laughs> so like Olivia is like an expert on acne without having studied it. I'm like, I talked a lot about like Selena on my podcast because I've done like extensive research. Um, and we think that like a lot of like young girls are experts in the banal. <laughs> um, and we have like guests on who are, you know, experts in their own thing. Our friend is coming on, he's talking about Drake. Um, we had a friend who's a poet also and a marine biologist talk about sharks and the relationship between science and poetry. Um, yeah. It's called Say More. It's streaming everywhere. <laughs> You got a question in the back? Do you have any other obsessions? Oh, many. Um, well, yeah, I have to be careful about like what I consume, like media, because I'll like think about it a lot. I just watched this movie that was really bad called Vox Lux with Natalie Portman. It was like a Star is Born, but like weird and weirder somehow and apocalyptic. Anyway, I was like, oh my god, oh my god. and I like listened to it. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm obsessed with a lot of things. I love, like, you know, Game of Thrones, Jane the Virgin. If I could write a poem about it, I'm probably obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah. I love consuming media. Mm -hmm. I saw in your other bio that you got a freeze ray. Yeah. And they specialize in pop culture. Yeah, what did you exactly. write about? Um, right, so, okay, I wrote a whole chapbook on Jessica Jones. <laughs> Um, and so I have like a Jessica Jones suite in there. It's like five poems where I imagine myself as Jessica Jones um, and kind of made it about a conversation about like how accessible feminism is to everybody um, or the ways in which it's not. Um, and like imagining like my mom as Jessica Jones and like all of these things. So yeah, those are my obsessions. Freeze Ray is a cool place to check it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do a lot of your poems like trace back to like your Latin? They do, yeah. Um, I think they're always going to, even if I don't mention it at all. It's like deep in there. It's the seeds of it, for sure. Yeah. Is this your first time in Kansas? It is, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It'll be okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, it's really lovely here. Everyone's really kind. <laughs> Um, I saw a beautiful purple weed, or I saw, I thought they were beautiful flowers, but they were weeds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>